This is the Amazing Education Podcast. Powered by the Ames Community School District, I'm your host, Eric Smith. On today's episode, we are joined by Superintendent Jenny Reisner. We're going to have an amazing conversation about the role of a superintendent, being responsive to the community, and the importance of articulating a vision for the district. Superintendent Reisner, thanks for being on. You know, this is the first episode of the Amazing Education Podcast. So I'm the groundbreaker. You are. You are. And I very much appreciate you coming on and and being able to talk with all of us about the role of a superintendent. And, you know, so when we talk about what the job of the superintendent is, you know, everyone, it's very easy to say it's to run the district, but what does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, being a superintendent and and being kind of the the lead of the school district, it's really about um, establishing the purpose and the priorities or the vision for the district. Um, I use the word purpose because for me, it resonates deeply with um, what is it? Why, why do we do the work we do? What does it mean to do the work we do? And so, you know, I think that is the primary responsibility of the superintendent is to set that purpose, set those priorities and keep coming back to those as you make decisions. Of course, being a superintendent, you're also the person that um, is responsible for the budgeting, for the work with the school board, for keeping them informed. Um, and so those those logistical and kind of management pieces. Um, but, but even beyond that, the curriculum and instruction, what we do on a day-to-day basis in the classroom. I think there are superintendents that are hands-off when it comes to that, um, and there are superintendents that are more engaged in that. Um, and, and it's just it can go either way depending on the superintendent's style. So one of the things that I really appreciate uh, about you is being very deliberate as far as living the purpose and priorities. So, you know, of course, you know, we made posters and and they're around. And and oftentimes, you know, I think in a lot of organizations, that's where it ends. And I really feel like it, it doesn't end for you, I think right. that, you know, when, when we look at, when we set a board agenda and we look at, you know, what are the big pieces that we're moving, you tie all of those to one of the five priorities. Right. So I think um, that helps us be accountable for our purpose and priorities and for knowing that. We read the purpose statement at every board meeting. I think it's active in all of our administrative meetings. Um, at, as you know, you've yeah. been in them. Yeah. We constantly are referring back to the wall and saying, you know, as we talk about in priority number one, Da, 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 da. And so I yeah. think um, really that I appreciate that deliberateness that the staff and the ownership that the staff has taken in in the purpose and priorities. So you segued a little bit because you, you hit big chunks of, of your position, you know, budget. I mean, you have your hand in everything, right. um, you know, budget, facilities, curriculum. How do you stay focused on the students? Because I feel like, you know, in, in, a, in a, you know, a large district or a semi-large district, like budget is, is, is hugely important. You know, you have that fiscal responsibility, but facilities are also important. And then, you know, you're talking about these big assessment pieces. And I think it can be very easy to lose sight of why we're here, yet I don't feel like you do. No, I, I'm passionate about students. I'm in this, I'm in public education because of my passion for students. And so um, for me, it's not difficult. Students are at the center of every decision I make. Students are um, at the center of our meetings, of our focus as a district. Um, I think that takes work for for making sure we continue to come back to that. It's very easy for district level people uh, to forget about what happens day to day in the classroom. For me, I've had the opportunity to be a teacher um, in multiple different levels, in in different roles. I've been a teacher, um, so I've done special education, I've done elementary education, I've done middle school, uh, and so I'm passionate about kids, and so that comes across in all I do. 
Um, and, and I think that's probably one of the things I look for when I'm hiring and developing leaders. It's that ability to put kids at the center of the decision making. So I also really appreciate having a focus of within the classroom. And so, you know, education, for those of us in education, we know that there are a lot of buzzwords, there are a lot of acronyms, and I mean, it can get confusing at times, but there's a lot of that. And yet, when it really comes down to it, one of the things that I think can sometimes get lost in the shuffle is how we interact with students in the classroom and taking that um, social emotional approach to students. And, and I feel like that is something we need to continually revisit. And I, and I think that, you know, you are doing that as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, that relationship piece, it, it's one of the key ingredients for leadership, but that's also the key ingredient in classrooms. So teachers having that ability to build relationships with students, um, that that's essential. And so we are deliberately doing things now to help enhance and um, increase that relationship building time. And I appreciate our teachers' willingness and really the willingness of the community to understand the importance of that. We face challenges in education that we've never faced before. So the social emotional um, learning that needs to happen, it's greater than it's ever been. We see that daily in classroom through um, some trauma in kids' lives and, and knowing how to approach those situations with a trauma lens. Um, and, and so learning those skills of te for teachers is different, and it's at times really taxing. So we have to continue to come back to this is our purpose, this is our priority, this is why we do what we do, and it's okay if you don't get to this lesson today because okay. you needed to step back and, and do some relationship building with students. So. By the way, you're very good at segueing. This is the second time you've segued into a, a, a very right. good topic. So <laughs> <laughs> give you a shout out there. <laughs> I find that to be interesting what you say, because I feel like when I went to college and, and I was studying to be a teacher, I was a and it was at high school level. It, I was a content person first. And I feel like that was the focus, sure. you know, 15 years ago. That was the focus to be you're a content person Yep. first and yet we're hearing you know today that yeah it, it's important don't get me wrong but it, it's it's we need a student focus first we are teaching students first mm -hmm. and and today our students need that they need that relationship first yeah. and so um, there's lots of research behind that and why and the importance of it but it takes time and it takes intentionality. And I think that we're understanding that more and more today as educators and as leaders and the value of that. So, you know, I, that's a great place for education to be headed. Yeah. You know, and I think another component of it allows teachers to be that first because when I was in school and then studying to be a teacher, um, I was the holder as a teacher, the holder of information. Um, you know, I think about at the high school level, teachers aren't always the holder of all of the information today. So it's really right. equipping students for um, what's next, you know, after school for them. So it's, it's working together, collaborating. Yes. It's learning how to find information. And so talk about that a little I bit. I love the way you put that um, because you're dead on. I think that students hold a lot of information nowadays. They have a cell phone right at their fingertips <laughs> they where they can Google and they can find out anything. So yeah. the days of teacher delivering all of the facts, students memorizing them, that's not working in education. Yeah. And so we know that um, breaking that that long history of sit and get is often difficult. Yeah. But you hit on it in that the teacher has shifted to become, I think, really effective teachers, I should say, have shifted and they become facilitators in the classroom. Yeah. And they allow students to have a voice, um, to, to have choice in their learning, yeah. um, for it to be engaging and hands-on and problem-based. And um, I, I think it's exciting where we're headed. And and I'm, I'm thrilled to yeah. be in public education right now. Yeah. I always try to compare what happens into the classroom 
to what happens in like real employment life. So I think about my life and I think about, um, you know, if I were to be asked to present what I know, it's not always just writing a paper right. or it's not just there are tons of options for students these days, and I think that's a huge shift. So I, I appreciate what you yes, said as far as sure. teachers facilitating the classroom. And I think one other thing, just to follow up with what you said, um, we we're training kids to go out into the world, and yeah. so to say things like no cell phones in class, really, what we're saying is we need to be we really need to be teaching kids how to use those effectively. So. In the middle of a meeting, when you're in a job, you probably shouldn't pull out your cell phone. So we're going to understand right. that. We're going to teach kids probably in the middle of a lecture or you shouldn't pull out your cell phone. Yeah. But there is a time. If you have an emergency, here's how you address it. Yeah. Um, in between classes, that's when you would right. make your calls. Well, even so, to build in, um, build in time within the classroom. I mean, the reality is all of our high school students, the vast majority of them, have cell phones. Right. I know that... I check my cell phone when, when we're in a meeting. You know, it's like we take a break. You know, we have a, a little right. lull. I check email or I do something. And that's, you know, at times perfectly acceptable. And yet it isn't Sometime, for students. Right. <laughs> Sometimes we don't allow that. So, yes, we were in public education. Sometimes yeah. we're slow to make those changes that yeah. need to be made. But I really feel like we're headed in the direction of making those. So how do you keep it all straight? In, in a week. I mean, I, I've seen your calendar. I mean, you know, we talk about those those big chunks. I mean, um, f budget, facilities, curriculum. And then, you know, as with many organizations, stuff rises to mm -hmm. the top. You know, you have to deal with a lot of things that I think people don't even realize. Yeah, I think um, things bubble up. <laughs> they do. Um, I, one of the things that is important to me is that relationship piece, regardless of what size the district is. Um, I think it's important for me to be visible, to be out in schools, to be meeting with teachers, meeting with principals. And so I'm committed to doing that. Um, and so finding that balance of yeah. how how you still manage those crises that come up yeah. that have to be dealt with immediately, but also understanding the importance of I can't lead a district if I don't know what's happening in our classrooms yeah. and if I don't hear from our staff and and have mm -hmm. that authentic conversation with them it's easy to put surveys out um, and it's easy for people to answer surveys but to sit and have one-on-one -on -one conversations yeah. with staff um, that's where you really gain the insight and so I think it's a matter of you have to set priorities and you have to, of course, take care of the business that comes up when it comes yeah. up, keep deadlines, but also don't lose sight of this student-centered approach. Yeah. And, and being in the buildings is one of those really important things. What type of, because I know you did it last year and you're committed to doing it this year, what type of feedback have you received from that? Because, I mean, there's times where you spend, I mean, I've went and visited you in buildings because you know we needed to we needed to catch uh, yeah, up yeah we on needed something. to catch up yes. on something yes. so um and that's incredibly important so what type of feedback have you received on that um really good i yeah. you know i think one of the things that you, sometimes you don't receive feedback sure. yet you know that you gain the insight yeah. you needed to gain to make a change yeah. in in something. It could be small. It could right. be in terms of scheduling. It could be, but you hear from enough staff mm -hmm. as you go through the day that hey, you know our blocks aren't working. Our blocks of time yeah. aren't working. We need this first, and and it's a district directive that we can't, and this is why it's not working. So hearing directly from the educators who yeah. are in the classroom every day. Um, is is really important. So even that feedback you don't get, sure. you know, it helped guide your decision making. You know, I think that um, it's in every business or every large organization, because um, the reality is many school districts, they are large organizations. And there's always um, there's the potential for a disconnect between decision makers and, and the reality. And so I think so, bridging that gap is is hugely important. It is. Um, Talk about empowering staff. I mean, you and I, we've had this conversation before as far as being very deliberate to empower people, whether it's um, directors, yep. principals, but but teachers as well, empowering them and, and empowering and then the power of them knowing that they are empowered. 
I so appreciate that question, um, and this is why I think I discussed it with you at some point last year. And you hear about accountability and um, holding people accountable, and and while that's really important, and you have to have high expectations and make those expe- expectations clear, um, there there's a shift that happened in, with my own thinking last year as I began to realize leaders need to own their work. And it goes beyond this accountability to more ownership in order to um, have leaders be really impactful and be engaged. They need to own their work. And so that means they need to have a voice in it and they need to be part of that decision making, just like we need to allow teachers to be part of the decision making at a building level. And then I take that clear down to the classroom level. And the power in public education comes when we allow that voice, that student voice and facilitation of the of the teacher. And and it's no different than what we do with our leaders. Yeah. So one of the things um, when you talked about having authentic conversations with people, it made me think of this because one of the changes that has happened in the last 15 years um, in addition to how education is run, it's, it's or in the classroom, it's how every business operates with the flow of information. So things move very quickly these days, as we're all aware of. And, and that's a good thing as yes. well, because I think every organization and, you know, school districts included, um, they leverage that quick flow of information um, in positive ways. Mm-hmm. How do we balance, you know, having authentic conversations with, you know, when you think about yeah. as a school district, you're always thinking about school improvement and change is part of that. And change is hard for a lot of people, um, myself included, you know, in different areas. I think for a lot of people, change is hard. So how do we balance that having authentic conversations right. with change? Right. <laughs> and and I, I know exactly what you're um, speaking about because there you want to be very transparent and very open and, and engage a lot of stakeholders yet there's difficulty with doing that because at times when you engage those people um, we haven't had an opportunity to to plan and vet things Mm -hmm. um, or we have had an opportunity to plan and vet things and then it looks like we're just engaging people, you know, as, as kind of just, okay, just so you, we have this token voice. Yeah. And that's not it at no. all. Um, and so that balance is really difficult. Yeah. And I will say I'm still learning that. <laughs> I'm still learning how to make um, that. And I think a lot of leaders nowadays yeah. are still learning that because the information flow is so quick. Yeah. You know, we can have a meeting, and before the meeting's even over, We can have community members or staff already posting things on social media during the meeting. And so there it's difficult to kind of get ahead sometimes of that information flow, um, as well as to really run an effective meeting and have it be one of those that really involves and and, um, talks with stakeholders about different options, because sometimes then those options leak out as decisions were made sure and yeah it's not the fact that's because not fact authentic conversation is a part of the research process um right there are a lot of things to get especially with big decisions i mean there are a lot of things to consider and without having those authentic conversations with hearing the lens from different people it's difficult to make any type of decision exactly so one of the th- big things, and, and I've actually um, had emails about this recently, um, and it was very awesome because I was able to point people to a purpose and priority statement, is having a focus on equity and really how do we reach every student. Mm-hmm. And I think equity isn't understood by every every person in our community, and so it's, it's kind of on us to educate them, but I know that a lot of districts and, and ourselves included are having a number of conversations on how we can reach different students and the conversations have been absolutely wonderful and, and so it's actually noted twice um, in our 
in the purpose and priorities, um, educational equity and improvement. And so talk about some of those conversations and that focus, because I think it's hugely important. Yeah, um, I think that one of the things that I heard and, and studied before I even came to Ames was that opportunity gap that existed. Um, and sometimes a lack of data behind that, mm-hmm. but a definite feeling that that was occurring and the data that we had indicated that was occurring. Yeah. Um, and so it caused me to really think about and be intentional about the strategies that we had. One of the things the district was already doing was critical consciousness work um, with Dr. Swalwell and Dr. Spikes. And that has been phenomenal, like you said. Um, They have been eye-opening, engaging, and they really push us to dig deep into our own biases that exist. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the key in my position has been really recognizing, hearing the voices that have been marginalized in the mm-hmm. past. Yep. And so um, that means sometimes being in situations that are uncomfortable, that, yeah. that have conversations that are really difficult and having to um, go back and understand, I come from a place that's much different and, and I need to hear and yeah. listen and and own the behavior um, that we sometimes have. Yeah. And although it's unintentional, you you have to recognize th- how the other person receives it. Yeah. Um, and so those those voices of our marginalized population have been phenomenal to hear. Yeah. The working relationship that we've developed with community organizations to help us. Um, walk through this process and break down barriers for students. Um, I don't know that we'll ever be there. Whatever that means, I think it's a day-to-day intentional lens that we have to put on as we're developing policies, as we're looking at classroom practices, um, as we're looking at curriculum. It's a lens that has to go on at all times. Mm -hmm. How, How does this impact or um, how do we bridge that gap yeah. with marginalized populations? Yeah. So the training has been the preparation for the real work, I feel like. And I feel like when it becomes uncomfortable and, you know, like you mentioned, the difficult conversations, that's where the growth is. Yep. And it's not easy at, at, at times. And yet you know it's the right work. And so I've, I've reflected on, you know, a number of, of situations and, and as difficult as the conversations were and, and at, honestly at times intense, that's where the growth is. And to be able to put yourself in somebody else's um, situation or at least attempt to um, absolutely can do wonders. Yes, and one of the things I think that has been powerful um, is – looking when situations happen, going back and owning it. That's one of the things that I heard over and over Mm -hmm. um, is this sense of, well, that's not what kids meant or that's not what we meant by that. It doesn't matter what we meant. This is how it was received. And and, and that's a powerful switch to make in your mind because then you look at things differently. We have to own that sometimes, yes, this is what the outcome was, and it wasn't, it did not feel good to marginalize populations, yeah. and we own that. Yep. So um, I know you and I had a situation <laughs> last year, yeah. and I think it's it's one that's really a good learning lesson for leaders out there. Yeah. Um, we had a situation where we had students at a game that were chanting um, something that maybe they've always chanted, and mm-hmm. it wasn't intended maybe to be what... But how it was received by some, yeah, by many, by many, yeah. felt very bad. And so we, rather than saying that wasn't our intention, mm-hmm. that wasn't what we meant by it, we owned it as a district. Yeah. We said, "Yep, that, and that was, wasn't popular. That was not a popular decision for us to own it as a district." Yeah. We had many people saying, "That's not what the kids meant. That's nope. not." However, it was received this way yeah. by marginalized populations and mm-hmm. we have to own and recognize yeah. that and change our behavior yeah 
So and I think it's incredibly important to be leaders in that front because I think that allowed us to have conversations. And, and it, I know at the high school they had conversations with students about that and, and very productive conversations. Absolutely, yes. And that's where the growth happens. Yes. Um, and I always like to say that it's not that isn't going to fix it. That one situation no, that no. you know we were able to educate, use it as an opportunity yeah. to educate our students. That's not going to fix it. Yeah. However, it is growing us and pushing us and and setting that um, precedence of we'll own the behavior. Yeah, we will own it. Absolutely. Well, as you know, as we wrap up this episode, it flies by. It does. <laughs> it really does. I know. Um, so we'll obviously we will very much do this again. But as you know, we are we're in the business of amazing. I mean, I think just the the energy of schools and and education is absolutely amazing. And so I wanted to give you an opportunity to wrap up this episode with something amazing from your world of education that you reflect on. And I I definitely want to come back <laughs> because I have so many amazing things I could yeah. talk about. Um, today, because we're talking kind of big, large, and scope, um, one of the things that I find absolutely amazing about education is when we allow and honor students' voice. Mm. Um, and when I see that in classrooms I go into, it is the most powerful moment, um, I think, of a child's education as well as of the teaching environment. And so when you hear students being able to own and be excited about, and at all levels, yeah. be excited about what they're doing. i real quick going to share, I don't know how much time we We're have. Good. Um, I was in a, I think, a kindergarten classroom last week, and the teacher was talking about, oh, it was so beautiful. The teacher was talking about kindness and fear and anxiety and how that all works together and it was part of a PBIS lesson oh, yeah. and um, positive behavior intervention it's our it's kind of our um, foundation for our, our behavior management yeah. system and the lesson was great and a kindergarten little boy raised his hand and he said you know I cried my eyes out the first day of school and he goes, and now I'm not scared anymore. And so that power of allowing <laughs> kids to own their feelings and to own the learning yeah. and, and to make it relatable to what their day – and the teacher had done a phenomenal job oh. of opening that door and saying, like, sometimes you feel scared or anxious, and the little kid just immediately – and it was just that power of this is what it's about. Yeah. This is when learning is real. Mm. I love that. Kids are awesome. Kids are awesome. They're amazing. They are amazing. We'll keep it up. Well, thank you, Superintendent Reisner. Thank you. This was great. 